if Mark Ajala combines his work as a psychotherapist in Barcelona with holotropic breathwork workshops and research of the applications of this technique. Mark collaborates with the ICERS, or ICEERS, support service, offering integration sessions to people who have difficult psychedelic experiences. Surfing the uncertain, integration of the personal experience as key to social transformation. Please welcome Mark Aizala. Thank you. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Thank you very much for, for coming to this presentation, having so many alternatives all around the festival. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to try to make this presentation as, as interesting and educational as possible. So I have a whole wrap prepared. I could be speaking for hours, but if you have some burning question that you really want to, to ask, please raise your arm and, and we can make it a little bit more dynamic. So surfing the uncertain integration of personal experiences as key to social transformation. That title is not mine, but it's a pretty good one. So uh, thanks for the guy that, that uh, designed it. But it's a very interesting thing because uh, over the years I've been specializing in, in integration of psychedelic experiences, but more in a psychotherapeutic approach. So in my daily work, I tend to see the not so pleasant aspects of psychedelic experiences. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but also of some of the pleasant aspects of the, of the integration uh, of psychedelic experiences. So, yeah, we're gonna share some words on what is integration, what do we understand uh, about integration, and what, what happens that integration sometimes becomes difficult? Why is that that integration is, is not a, an easy task to, to approach? Uh, we'll see how we do that to promote integration, and then we will talk about the two dimensions that I like to, to consider, the uh, social and the individual dimensions of integration, because usually we are very much focused on the individual um, dimension of integration, but we'll see that that is also related to what happens in a social level. So what is integration? It seems like we talk all day about integration of psychedelic experiences. I need to integrate, you need to integrate, I have integrated my experience, or he has not integrated his experience. So we use that word all the time, but I don't really know if we know what integration is, but how do we know what we have already integrated an experience when, when an, e an experience needs more integration? How do we know that? Because it's interesting that it seems that on a level we understand each other, we talk about integration and we understand what we mean, but if we dig a little bit deeper, we don't really understand what we mean by integration. So, so over the years, integration has been the more uh, neglected aspect of the psychedelic experience. So there are huge tons of books expla explaining the nature of psychedelic experiences, the different realms in which we can go, uh, perinatal, transpersonal, biographical. We have uh, shamanic maps of uh, inner spaces. We have Tibetan maps of uh, uh, hells, heavens, and all that. And then we say, OK, and then you have the experience, and you integrate the experience. But that, there's not a lot written about integration. So yeah, we're kind of lost in the integration of the experiences. And, and this is something that as psychedelics and um, uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness become more and more uh, natural and mainstream, we, we, we find the need for integration. These last years, we've been seeing a globalization and extreme uh, development of the ayahuasca retreats in, in Peru, for example. Or, for example, in Barcelona, you can find the, uh, plenty of ayahuasca sessions every weekend. So this is something that is becoming more and more mainstream. And, w and in that situation, we realize that there's a need for integration. So we don't know what integration is, but we hope that from there we get to a point in which we can get some more ideas about what is integration, what to do to promote integration, and when we know that integration has occurred. Yeah? So some metaphors about integration. This is a classic one. Integrating is putting the pieces back together. It's like a psychedelic experience. It's like shaking your unconscious, allowing material to, to arise. And then you have all these pieces, and you have to put them back together. That's a good metaphor, but I think that this image is, is even better, because if you see the pieces, they need to be kind of polished. So the new piece needs to be kind of, I don't know, cut, polished in order to fit the, the what's already there, but also the, the the ancient or the already built structure needs to be adjusted in order to fit that experience that we've had. So it's a twofold 
kind of uh, relationship. The experience, how we place our experience with our uh, daily lives and what we do with our daily, daily lives to include the experience that we've had. Yeah. We have some other metaphors. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, integration sometimes is described as, okay, you're having these experiences that can be related to the spiritual realms, uh, but how do you do to grow kind of in both directions, like reaching the spiritual realms, but at the same time, keep your roots on the earth, keep uh, touch with reality. It's um, something that, that um, in traditional psychology and psychiatry, they, they make some fun of us, you know? We have transpersonal experiences, but what do we do with those experiences? And even people that, that know the nature of uh, psychedelic experiences, they, uh, I don't know if you know Paul Václavík. Paul Václavík is one of the uh, main representatives of the radical constructivism in which they say that we construct our reality. So in a way, that's a, a very psychedelic approach, the constructivism. We, we create the real, reality that we perceive. It's not a one fixed reality, but each of us has our own reality. And Paul Václavík, he said that Psychedelic experiences, they are very interesting, but it's very difficult to get something useful out, for, out of them. We might agree or we might not agree, but in clinical practice we find that usually there's some work to be done in order to maximize the benefits that one can get from a psychedelic experience. So we always, when, when uh, approaching this from a, a clinical point of view, one of the criteria to see is the integration happening or not is if the transformation is happening in both in these both directions. You know, is your daily life more rooted, more grounded, and your spiritual life also developing, or you're just growing in one or the other direction? Yeah. So, some other metaphors. Integration. I don't know if you remember integrating when you were at school. I like maths a lot, and and it's a beautiful language to explain things. So when we integrate. We are integrating the fx function, and the objective of integration is finding what function that comes from. Yeah? So we're looking for something that we don't know yet. It's the same thing with psychedelic experiences. You have a psychedelic experience in which you see all a whole bunch of things that in a way maybe you cannot explain. You don't know where they come from. You don't know what, what's the, the general envelope of that experience. We're looking for something that we haven't seen yet. And I like this next image because it emphasizes the practical dimensions of integration. So if integration doesn't have an impact on, on real life, I don't know if that's integration or not. You know, it's just another experience. So what do you see in this image? Okay, yeah, a football, a football, yeah. But if you look at that image, there's not a football over there. You have just some hexagons or pentagons. Why do you see a, a football? because your brain is integrating that from all the experiences that you have already had, you're able to recognize that as a football, but it's not a football, that's, that's not a football over there. Same thing with the next one. <clears throat> what do you see there? Probably a cube, yeah? But, but there's not a cube over there. There's just some dots with some lines and you could see the cube going towards outside or towards the inside. So it is your brain that does the integration of, this, of these figures. And as you can see, the result of what you have here is something else, is in another level of... Um, yeah, so I mean, these points here, they cannot create a cube. It's your brain that creates a cube. It's another level of representation. You just see points and then integration occurs and you see the cube. So in a way, integration, when it has already happened, it doesn't require an effort. We don't have to do an effort to see a cube here because we have already integrated those pictures and we, we see what's going on there. But I don't know if we show that to a two-year-old kid, I don't know if he's going to see the cube here. Maybe not. Yeah? Why is that? Because of previous experiences and, uh, and your previous development shapes the way that you perceive reality and how you integrate things in your present situation. Yeah? So the general um, overview of the psychedelic experience has been like this for many, many years. Preparation, the session, and integration. So preparation, we know about preparation. We know about the experience itself, like uh, the boom festival experience. And then it's assumed that after the experience, there's uh, some integration to be done. But this, this uh, approach, although it's very, very useful, 
it has some problems in terms of seeing uh, like separate parts of it. Yeah? So you have first part integration, then second part experience, and third time integration. And reality is that with this approach, we focus the attention on the experience itself, what happens during boom, during your psychedelic experience, during, I don't know, whatever experience you're having. Yeah? But um, it's very interesting to look at the, at the overlapping spaces. When you go from preparation to the experience, and when you go from the experience to out of the experience, and when you do the integration. So in a way, this, this doesn't happen like separated things. It's more like an ongoing process that keeps developing. So imagine what will happen in Boom. We're just starting the festival now. So in a way, we are in a liminal stage. We are beginning to enter this new experience. Yeah? And when we will leave, we will, we will not leave the same way. We will take some days in order to decompress from the experience. So it's very interesting to look at those liminal spaces in which you are entering the experience or going out of the experience, because a lot of things happen there. And it's not so clear to separate when the experience finishes and when the experience is still going on. And this is one of the very, very important things when doing a, a psychotherapeutic approach, is, OK, the, the experience has already finished, but the person that comes to talk to you is still in contact with that experience. It's still, in a way, bringing those energies or those experiences that happened into the present moment. So. Then comes the, the, the question, how do we separate these, these different parts of, of the experience? Here in Boom Festival, I don't know how many psychedelic experiences you're going to have, but I remember first time I came here, I had a whole plan. First day, this. Second day, this. Third day, that. And then things happen along the way. So, OK, maybe three, four, five uh, different psychedelic experiences inside the whole uh, Boom experience. Th does that count as one experience, or uh, two experiences, or just the boom experience, how do we separate that? And if you realize it's very interesting what happens during those liminal spaces between one experience and the next experience. And that is where the work, I think, can be really done. That's the, like, like the juicy thing of this, of this uh, metaphor. In a way, I see that as a kind of fractal uh, representation of the process. You're having experiences in the experiences in the experiences. So you have an LSD trip, but when it finishes, you talk with someone. And because of what happened before, you're having some kind of relationship that it's turning something from your inside. And then you work with that. You know? So things are happening all the time. And in the end, it goes to the point in which, wh what is it? It's the, what's the important? The psychedelic experience, the preparation, the integration. In the end, what's the difference of all that? Maybe it's just one thing. It's just we're living and we're having the human experience. So as you see, one can see many levels in this, in this, uh, in this process. And I think it's interesting to pay attention to these details, because it can, it can give us a, a, a better way to use these, these tools and these opportunities as, OK, this is something that's happening, but it's an ongoing process. It's not something that happens, stops, and I forget about that. Yeah. Again, in engineering, they have this, this um, signal, this is called chirp, and it's a signal that goes, this is what, for example, bats do with their sonar to detect the insects and all that, uh, and it's a signal that goes from a very low frequency, that's the frequency in, um, in the lower axis, and that's the intensity in the, in the vertical axis. So it goes from very low frequency, and when you have very low frequency, very low intensity, all the way to very, very high uh, frequency, and as you see, the intensity is low at the same time. This is similar to what uh, happens with these uh, balls that you play, like do tac, 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 tac. You know that? So the, at the first, the frequency is zero. Then you start and tac, 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 tac. It starts to go faster, 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 and in the end, it stops. But what is the difference between those so fast impacts and when it stops? If you think about that, it's a little bit weird. You know, it goes. Faster, 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 until it stopped. Where's the moment in which that stops? So that's also a metaphor that I like to look about that. And in a way, we will have uh, many psychedelic experiences, many life experiences with friends, lovers, teachers, at work. And all these are waves that are coming. We're just experiencing that the whole time. What's the difference in approach of uh, I don't know, uh, um, a conflict that you have with a friend or a psychedelic experience. Is there a difference in that? I don't really know. It's just experiences that we're having. Yeah? How, we, how we use those experiences, how we work with those experiences. That's what integration is about. 
we all want to have like the ultimate trip. We want to get to enlightenment and, and really use these tools to, to free ourselves and to be more happy and to, and to live more fulfilling lives. But sometimes uh, things are not so easy. We start having fun and then things can get challenging and even dangerous and sometimes we don't really know where we are ending. So this is a part of integration that makes things a little bit more difficult. Yeah? So when you have a pleasant experience, that's not really a big deal, usually. You have a nice experience, it can end, and then everything has been okay. But um, what if the experience has not been so nice? What if the surfing experience has become uh, a painful experience? This is something that can happen. And this is something that challenges integration. When these things happen, it's not so easy to integrate the experience because we don't want to be in touch with that experience anymore. What we want is just to finish that experience and go to something else, you know, to go back to our old uh, well-being. But we have been through, through a, a painful experience. So when we have... Pardon me? Well, sure it hurts. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Pain, pain is, is part of the, of the experience, but when it happens, integration becomes a little bit more difficult. So usually, those of us that work in the integration field with, uh, with clients, we don't get the people that have had the most amazing and beautiful experiences. The people that come to see us are those that had the painful experiences. Uh, and, and this is something that usually it's what we understand better as integration, okay? If someone has had a difficult experience and is having problems in going out of the experience or the symptoms that he felt they are repeating over and over, that's a clear sign that integration has not happened, yeah? So that's very clear, okay, if he's suffering after the experience, integration has not occurred. Um, what can be the, the, the challenging experiences? I don't know, many, many things. Many things can be, can be challenging in, in psychedelic experiences. Uh, since contacting a traumatic event that you had in the past, uh, even, I don't know, analyzing some relationship that you have with friends, what I have to explain to you, you know that yourself, so, yeah. So something that we see that it's consistently on the root of the difficulties after psychedelic experiences. Uh, when you, you see that people are having struggles after uh, psychedelic experiences, is the lack of preparation. Um, so, for example, tonight, probably there's a whole bunch of people trying LSD for the first time in their lives. Yeah? And LSD can produce a whole range of experiences, some of them pleasant, some of them not so pleasant. Yeah? And what happens is that sometimes you don't really know what can happen. Yeah, so you don't know what you're stepping into, and that makes uh, takes courage. One has to jump into the, onto the unknown, and what you encounter there sometimes is a mystery. What happens if you're not prepared for that experience? We have another example that's happening over and over these days. Uh, the globalization of ayahuasca has made that ayahuasca is sold as a, a something that you take and it will cure you. Yeah, it's following this medical system. Take ayahuasca, this is a medicine. If you take ayahuasca, you're drinking off or you drink with me, you're going to feel better, you're going to be cured. Okay, what happens sometimes that people go to these kind of experiences, they have a horrible experience, they remember a traumatic event they had, they, they go into a full uh, psychotic kind of experiences, and, and what do you think about that after that? If I take a medicine that is supposed to be curing me with a guy that does sessions and is healing people, and I have this wrong, uh, this, this terrible experience, that means that there's something wrong in me. Because I've taken a medicine, and I'm having uh, not, not normal reactions, so it's me, the one that's wrong. And this might seem um, a silly thing for those of, of us that have experience and maybe have read books about challenging experiences and know this, this process of encountering your own demons and your own darkness, but this is not what a lot of people know when they first step into a, into a psychedelic experience. So then, if that happens, you look for help. What has happened to me? Yeah? And in these cases, people have real problems after the experience. It's not just I've had a bad trip. It's that they go home, they cannot uh, be in darkness, they cannot turn the lights of their, their place, they don't want to be alone, they have sudden panic attacks. I mean, this has become something very incapacitating. And what do you do with that? You, you need to do something with that. But again, it's not, it's not only the, 
the traumatic experiences that can raise a challenge for integration. So uh, I think it was, yeah, Leo Zeff, that um, pioneer in psychedelic therapy, he said that the way that he did the LSD sessions and the LSD therapy was, was quite peculiar, and that there, there, he had clients coming that had uh, done LSD for more than 100 times, yeah, more than 100 times, and when they did the, the LSD experience with him, they said, I had never had an experience like this. Now I understand something else. I've gone a, a, a level, a deeper level into my experience. Stan Groff said the same thing. He had uh, patients he was working with, and maybe they had five, six, seven, eight psychedelic experiences, and they kind of took a lot from the experience. But he says that there's people that have taken LSD hundreds of times and they still have not started to confront with their own things. They, they did not started like an inner journey. It's more been like, a, like an amazing uh, experience, but not really a transformational journey. So this can be also with, uh, due to the lack of preparation. W what are you expecting from the experience? What do you want the experience to, to give you? What is your intention when you're going into that experience? That is a lot that has a lot to do with what will happen in the experience and how will you process it after it has happened. So, so the better preparation you have for the experience, the most likely is the experience to be nice and pleasant, and the most likely is the integration to be uh, smooth and easy. The less preparation you have, the more work you'll have to do afterwards. Yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about difficult experiences. When one sees a difficult experience that has not been properly handled during the session, it's a sad thing to see because you see someone that has gone to a, a retreat, they had a horrible experience, they come back and they spend weeks and months with panic attacks and it's, it's really, really uh, terrible to see because they went there for healing, you know, they wanted to heal something. It's not that they went only for, for fun, they, they look for someone who, who could heal them and they end up with, with different problems that they were not expecting from the beginning. So, yeah, relieving traumatic events is one of the main situations in which this, this kind of difficult experiences can happen, but also experiences of death and rebirth, if you, know, you don't know that that can happen, experiences in which, uh, like, really immersive transpersonal experiences, people contacting with entities or energies or discovering like these energies moving around, which does not believe, uh, belong to the belief system. And they have a conflict with that. And this can be a, a source of, of suffering. Basically, a suffering that it's, it's a physical suffering. They cannot sleep, they have panic attacks, they have pro uh, problems with uh, relationships with the family, the family want them institutionalized, they cannot go to work. I mean, this can be very incapacitating. So it's, it's a sad thing to see. And most of the times when this happens is due to a lack of preparation, a difficult experience, but then the not so good handling of the experience itself. Yeah? During the session, if the experience is not supported in a proper way, then it becomes much more difficult to integrate, which takes us to the, to the next thing. The setting and who you do the experience with has an incredible impact on the outcome of the experience. Yeah? Sadly, it's more and more common to hear of people complaining about the places that they've gone to drink ayahuasca, for example. Most of the, the clients that I get, they, they come from um, the ayahuasca community, so sometimes they complain about the behavior of the shaman, the behavior of the facilitator. Sometimes things happen during the sessions that they should not, not happen at all. So, for example, there was this, this woman from New York that he said that he had a kind of a client therapist relationship with a guy that he called himself a shaman and was offering retreats in, in Peru. So he told her that in order to really go through her healing, which had to do with sexual abuse, she needed to go to Peru with him and spend three weeks or a month doing ayahuasca sessions with him. This woman didn't knew the ayahuasca community. She had never been in touch with other groups. so. Okay, if your therapist says that, you do what your therapist says because you trust your therapist. She went alone with, with him to Peru, and then she started having so powerful experiences. He was trying to sexually interact with her during the experiences and afterwards and giving her kind of weird feedback. No, but you really need to, uh, to have sex with me because that is going to improve your self-confidence or whatever. You know, these kind of things that should never happen that is happening. And the person at that moment doesn't know that that is not appropriate because has a trusting relationship with this, with this person. 
This is kind of an extreme case, but this is happening in different levels pretty, pretty often. Facilitators that they are not so uh, prepared to run sessions, and they run sessions because it's good business. I mean, it's very good business to, to do sessions nowadays. But also it can happen the other way around. You know, you go to a retreat, and this is also a real case. You have a really wonderful experience, heart opening, you feel connection with your peers and the people that attended the workshop, and all of a sudden you find your soulmate in that retreat. You know, you find a person in which you connect a lot, you share a lot of your experiences, you see that you have a, a real connection, that your lives have been pretty similar, and all of a sudden it seems that that's the person that you want to have a relationship with. You go back home and you to this experience that you've had, that it's so enlightening and so powerful, you decide to uh, leave your wife or your husband. Yeah? And a month after that, you realize that that was not exactly what you needed. And then you have the problem of having left a relationship, the experience that you had with ayahuasca, which doesn't make really sense into your reality. And then what you do? Then you look for help. Yeah? And these are real cases. And, and, and how do you help a person that is in such situation? That's not about the ayahuasca anymore. It's about life decisions that they've taken because of that experience that they probably didn't give enough time for it to settle down and to, and to, and to integrate in a, in a way. So, yeah, the setting and the facilitation can be elements that add some challenges to the, to the integration process. Then what we do in order to provide integration, how do we facilitate that integration happens. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk about two examples. First of, probably you've heard this over and over today here in this in liminal village. Here at Boom, we have a, which I feel is a very professional service to provide a safe space for those having challenging uh, experiences that can be related to psychedelics, but also it can be uh, spontaneous experiences that happened in, during the festival. So. What do we do here? What we try to, to provide here is a space in which people can really go through the experience. So it's not because you're encountering something difficult in your experience that it's something wrong in your experience. Probably if there's something challenging in your experience, what you need is a space in which you can go through that, in which you can allow yourself to feel that and process that experience. Because we've seen for many, many years, and the pioneers said that already, that the fastest way to overcome a challenging situation is to really go into that, to really allow yourself to feel the experience, process those emotions, those memories, those thoughts, or whatever it is, and then you can move forward. Then you can go to another thing. But usually when one encounters such challenging experiences, there's a resistance. We don't want to go into that. So it's not that a cosmic error. We, we say, no, you need to go and experience this pain and or remember this traumatic event or whatever. No, but this is already happening. But the pain comes from resisting that experience. So. Cosmic Air basically is a space in which you can be a little bit more calm, that in the outside you have someone that will sit with you and talk with you if you want to talk, or just sit with you for hours if you don't, if you don't want to talk, and provide you a, a space in which you can really allow the experience to unfold. If the experience unfolds, then half of the work of integration is done. If, then, if the experience can, can finish and allow itself to really process, it's strange that one will find a lot of difficulties afterwards. You know? So the first, uh, the first aid approach to this kind of, uh, of experiences and to facilitate the integration is to really allow the experience to complete itself. Sometimes this happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. And that's why at ICERS we, we decided to create a support service. This is a, an initiative that has happened since the 60s. Uh, Christina Graf created the Spiritual Emergency Network. So this is basically a a community in which someone that has had a difficult experience can go to someone that understands the paradigm that we talk about, this transpersonal paradigm, and find some support. Because if someone that has had an ayahuasca experience and has gone wrong goes to the psychiatrist with panic attacks and uh, anxiety and delusional thoughts, we all know what is going to happen. Medication, chronic illness, years of treatment, and bad quality of life. So why not trying different approaches to begin with to see if we can really provide a support that helps the person to move forward and use that experience as something to grow, something to heal and to learn. And this is what we try to do at ISIS. We, we get um, contacts from people that all different kinds of situations, MDMA, MDMA sessions that have been challenging, uh, ayahuasca retreats that uh, have been 
badly organized or really glowing experiences that people don't know where to put in their lives. You know, I've discovered that life is much more than your job, money, uh, paying your mortgage and going to work. It's, life is much more than that. So what do I do with this new spiritual dimension that I discovered, how I bring it to my daily life? Some people have struggles with that. They, they realize that their place in life is not to go to job every day and that's not gonna fulfill them because they discovered some other dimensions and that becomes a source of suffering for them. So that also needs integration because yeah, it's true. We are more than our jobs and our relationships and our careers. But how do we manifest these, these spiritual realms in our lives? Sometimes that it's not easy and it can be a, a, a source of, yeah, not problems, but suffering. Yeah. So integration and transformation. I like to think that uh, transformation would be the visible result of integration. So if one integrates what happens in our own lives, that is going to transform us. And the transformation is going to be visible on the outside. I have a, <laughs> a, a friend that he's been many, many years in, in Peru, and he's a, an ayahuasca practitioner. And he says, you know what? It's very easy to have an ayahuasca experience and, and feel love for your dad, for example. Well, easy. Yeah? That can happen. You can have an experience, feel love to your dad, and say, wow, I really love, I really re respect my dad. I forgive all what you've done to me in my biography, or whatever. And he says, but it's not so difficult to go back home and really love your dad and forgive your dad and have a good relationship with your dad. So this is where the challenges to integration are. You know, once one has felt loved to the family, forgiven the family, how is that going to manifest in the relationship that you have with your family? Because in the end, I'm a, an engineer by training. If things don't work, they don't work, and you need to do something for them to work. So if the relationship with your dad is not working and you love him when you have a LSD, MDMA experience, but you go back home and you're having fights every other day, maybe there's something else that you need to do to really bring that love that you're experiencing on an internal level to manifest on a relationship level. Yeah? Integration can be seen first as an individual task, so it's us who have the experience, not the outside. Yeah? We are having the experience. And what is to integrate in this experience? Okay. So I like to see like different dimensions. For sure there are some personal dimensions, which is what has happened in the experience? What are, were you thinking? What were you seeing? Sometimes that's the, the most approachable uh, part of integration. I saw this symbol, I was thinking about this, I was seeing that image. That's kind of easy to, to narrate, to explain. But what emotions were you, were you feeling? Did you allow yourself to feel those emotions? Were you feeling, if you feel happy, that's very easy, but you won't feel sad or angry, that maybe is a little bit challenging. If one contacts with sadness and realizes, you know what, deep inside of me, I am sad. And that is true. And you realize that in your, in your daily life. Yeah. What about your physical body? Sometimes some, uh, some experiences can be very physical. The body wants to express the experience. The body wants to move and release some energies that are happening through the body. Um, I have a very good friend and mentor that she's a trauma a therapist and she says that trauma has an emotional and a, and a cognitive part but it has a, also a body uh, part and actually we heal trauma through body. Trauma is embodied, it, it stays in our body when we, when we have a trauma. So the body is also uh, something to think about when, in, uh, when thinking about integration. And also then the, the spiritual dimension, so how does your uh, psychedelic experiences influence your uh, spiritual approach to, to life, or, or, or not. Maybe you discover that you don't want to have a spiritual approach to life, which is spiritual in its own way. And, and the behavior, okay, all this that happens, does it manifest in a way that other people can see that? Maybe yes, maybe it doesn't, yeah? So we have some uh, individual dimensions of, of integration, but I don't know if you read Kafka's book, The Metamorphose. So this book is about a guy that one day he wakes up and he has become a bug, yeah? So he is completely transformed on the outside. He's become a bug. But the first thought that he has when he wakes up is, I have to go to work. I'm going to be late for work. And then all the first part of the book is his struggle to get out of bed 
and going to the door, trying to find his clothes, thinking about what are they going to think when they realize that I've become a bug. So this guy, there's something has changed in this guy, but he's still the same person that was before. See the, the shadow of this guy that is still a guy, you know? So in a way, he has not changed. He, he has not integrated his new reality. He's become a bug, but he's thinking as a man, and he wants to relate with his family as a bug. In a way, all his worries are the original worries that he had, but only changed but because of the body that he's having now, but he hasn't changed at all on the inside. What are some, some challenges that we have in, in individual dimensions of integration? Okay, this is, uh, has been discussed over and over in, in literature. The spiritual bypass, this is what uh, traditional psychologists usually say to us. You know, you focus on the spiritual and you forget the personal and the interrelationship, uh, the relationship uh, aspects of it. Well, it's true. Sometimes it happens. There's a, a really, really beautiful conflict or story in, in, this, in this regard. I don't know if you know Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein. They are two meditation teachers that they worked very close together for some years. And at some point, they decided to split because their schools were completely different. So uh, Jack Goldstein, he thought, he, be he belongs to a school, a very kind of strict school, that says that the only important thing is liberation. So one should focus on liberation. Meditate until you attain liberation, and that's what you need to focus on. Not the rest, liberation. You just go to that. Jack Cornfield, on the other hand, he realized that some of his students could not focus on liberation because they were worried by the relationships they had with their mom, by my income or the job that I have, it doesn't suit me, or uh, having this conflict or whatever. So he started realizing that he needed to do some other work that was not only focusing on liberation. So in a way, jo uh, Joseph Goldstein would be the, the professional spiritual bypasser, but that's a school that in the East, it's completely respected. You focus on liberation, and that's the only thing that matters. And if you attain that, the path is cleared. You go directly to nirvana. So why focusing on other things? That's a very respectable approach. Truth is that we Westerners usually go to work, have uh, partners, kids, parents, and we need to worry about these, these other things. So if our spiritual experiences with psychedelics are taking our attention out of the places that we need to put attention on, then we are bypassing some things. And that's a pity, because we could use those experiences to really improve that. Ego inflation, this is something that's been commented over and over and over. What I think most important of ego inflation is not to go around spotting inflated egos. Well, you know, he's such an inflated ego. It's the other way around, you know, spot ourselves. Am I becoming over optimistic about my own development? I'm above already, I know uh, everything, I've become enlightened already. So ego inflation is something more to look on, on oneself than to, to look around, yeah? And some other sneaky challenges that I, that I found in my uh, professional practice is people that, through these transpersonal experiences, their belief system changes so much that in a way it becomes detached from consensual reality. So people, for example, I'm thinking of a case a woman that, that was drinking ayahuasca like maybe 20 times in f five months, something like that. So he, she was drinking pretty often because she suffered from anxiety and some social phobia, and she thought that ayahuasca could help her, which could happen. So she decided to go all the way and drink as much ayahuasca as she could to really overcome that. But on the way, what happened is that her fears, her interests, and her problems faded to another dimension. So she started uh, becoming more interested in um, the entities that are not visible, the energies around, spirits around, uh, possession states, um, alien connection, which is very respectable, but took the focus away of what she initially was worried about. And then it became a problem because all her reality was based on that. So then she would go on the metro and say, you know, I was looking at a man and he looked at me and we had this connection. and. I knew that he knew that uh, what I was thinking, you know? So this is something that had not happened before to her. And it's happening now because of this other dimension opening too fast for her to, to process, you know? So, so it, it is a danger that we have with, with psychedelics to, to lose contact with consensual reality. 
And there have to be pioneers that are really far out, expanding the, the horizon of what is possible and what we need to pay attention to, of course. I know that that's not my role. I mean, I'm a quite normal guy that I like to be in society and adapted to society. And, and this is the, the challenge that we have. When we're talking about integration, is how we bring those experiences that are so far out in our daily uh, experience, our daily lives. You know, how we make this, this, this connection between, this, between these worlds that can look a little bit different. Yeah, I put this image because it's a, a good idea of how these, these experiences can be solved. Who doesn't want to be a hippie with this wonderful van, this nice guitar, these two beautiful girls? That's showing only the, the beautiful side of, of one thing. But at the, at the same time, it's kind of a superficial part of it. I mean, I'm sure that this van has no petrol and that these guys are not friends each other. You know, that's what happens probably in, in reality. But yeah, we sometimes like to see this, this superficial and not going to, to the deep part of it. And there was this other guy. Okay, you can sell surfing because it's a cool thing to sell alcohol, you know? And you can sell ayahuasca retreats because it's a whole cool thing and it's for healing and spiritual transformation, but you're just making money and you have no real interest in, in healing or, or personal development or, or anything. So one has to be honest about that. And it's not that I find anything wrong with uh, using surfing to sell alcohol, but one needs to know what is happening there. I mean, this is what we're doing. Okay, so this is what we're doing. Then, uh, social aspects of, of integration. A lot of the times that, that, uh, that we have problems in integrating and experience is because of our environment. In the shamanic tradition, for example, if we talk about integration, they will probably laugh at us. They, there's no integration in shamanic traditions. Why there's no integration? Because it is not needed. It's already integrated in their experience. So you go, you drink ayahuasca, you have your dreams, as some of the traditions call them, and then you explain it to your family, no, I took ayahuasca, I saw this, I saw that, I have to do this, I have to do that, or I have this spirit and that uh, the shaman took it away from me and now it's okay. That is already integrated, so there's no need to talk about integration. But what happens when we Westerners go to another uh, cosmolo, cosmo vision and try to adapt our integration to their integration and make sense out of it, this, this is something that can be really, really difficult. Same thing that happened with Gregor Samsa in the, in the, the Metamorphose. In the whole book, he didn't change at all. He wanted to go to work and relate to his family, and family changed. If you've read the book, you will remember that the, the sister of, of Gregor Samsa, she was a very shy girl and kind of very pacific. And through the book, she becomes another person because that guy has become a bug, you know, and he becomes uh, more assertive, even aggressive. Parents, they also change the behavior they had towards the son. So, he, that's the one that looks, that has, has transformed, he doesn't change at all, it's the family that has changed. Yeah? And then the relationship changes. So, when we want to integrate our experiences, we need to know where, where we are. If I, am, uh, if I become to a shamanic perspective, it's going to be very difficult to understand for me the way that uh, the research nowadays is done. What do you mean that in an ayahuasca session, the facilitator or the shaman doesn't drink ayahuasca. That makes no sense in the shamanic perspective. But it makes all the sense if you go to a study in which uh, ayahuasca is provided for PTSD, that the investigator that doesn't receive uh, ayahuasca. So you need to make some sense out of it. And some people, they have difficulties of that for, for very good reasons. If you are born in a Catholic family and go to Santo Daime, Maybe you can understand what the saints are about, Jesus Christ and all that, but, but what if you go to a yoga retreat and they talk about chakras, and then you have Jesus, chakras, and the different cosmovisions can raise challenges to integration. So if you belong to one tradition and try to stick to another one, it's a sort of challenge some, sometimes. So these are some of the different approaches that we have uh, nowadays to, to use psychedelics and to, to get healing from psychedelics. But we mix them, and they are, it's not that they are that separated. We mix them, and in a way, we need to find the mixture that works well for us. We need to find, as Paul Watzlawick said, we need to find the narrative that makes sense for us. How do I explain my own reality? What's the meaning of the experience that I'm having to me? Because in the end, 
and I am in contact with society, so I need to juggle with that. I need to adapt my internal explanation with the uh, external explanation that society is giving and find a point in which that makes sense in my relationship to society. <clears throat> yeah, because we talk about transformation of, of society through, through psychedelics. And I think that this is already happening, whether we want it or not. Psychedelics are back on the mainstream. There are many studies about the M MDMA potential for PTSD and many other things. So this is already happening. Yeah. In this environment we are now, so let me start over. The scientists, they found a language and a method to convey the message that they want to convey to general society. They talk about results, the decreasing of symptoms. They do not talk about for example, the ecological implications of having a psychedelic experience, because that is not what probably society wants to hear from them. So scientists, they found a way to convey the message that psychedelics used in a certain way then can be very useful. And, and society is accepting that already. So in a way, psychedelics are already starting to be integrated in the mainstream. There are uh, studies that cost thousands of uh, dollars that are happening already. So this is a reality. OK, the context we are in now, it's a little bit more difficult to integrate. Yeah, how do we explain to society what, what do we do here? How does this affect society? I think in the end, it's not such a big deal because whether we want it or not, we are society already. So we are part of, of the human race and, and, and the human beings on the planet. So what we do is affecting what is happening on the outside. And it's easy to... Oh, I mean, what the, the relationship that get created in Boom, for example. I've been coming here for several years now, and and I have some friends that I only see once every two years when I come here to the festival. But the relationship that we created is a good bonding. We have a good relationship. We feel part of a tribe, part of a family. We feel this connection. Yeah. So we are in a way connected to to a lot of people here in a way. There's respect in this festival for individual difference and collective gatherings and, and, and spiritual exploration in whatever way you want to do that. So this already exists. And we want to integrate that into the mainstream. We want to integrate that in our jobs. We want to integrate that in our families. And in the end, we need to reach a point in we also integrate with things that we might feel very disintegrated with drug policies, governments, um, geopolitics. We also need to integrate to that. You know, if we're talking about integration, if psychedelics are integrated into society, they're going to become mainstream. That's going to become the regular thing. And actually, this is what we're looking for. So how do we m make these bridges so this happens? What do we do? What do you do as an individual to really bring what you discover in these uh, transpersonal realities into this society, into this world, how does it affect your life and your well-being and the well-being of the others around you, yeah? Um, yeah, that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Have a good boom and good surfing. Some questions? Yeah. We might have time for some questions, so if you want to comment or share your experience or anything, you're welcome to do so. Um, you were talking at the end about uh, the impact of resistance. Um, with decriminalization in Portugal, uh, how much of an impact has that had in terms of um, the nurturing environment a space like Boom could have for people having psychedelic experiences? Mm. Well, I think that it has had an incredible impact. I'm no expert on this field, but to begin with, with such policies, you can implement harm reduction uh, services. You can do a drug analysis and you can do cosmic care service, like uh, supporting the difficult experiences. In a way, you're acknowledging that there's drug use in society and that that's going to happen forever. You know, this is not going to change. So the fact that one understands, okay, that's drug use, that's, let's decriminalize that it allows to work in a more calmer way. You know, we don't need to hide, as the, the friends from uh, the Zendo project need to do at Burning Man, we don't need to hide that there's drug use here. 
and people that come to cosmic care, they've probably been using drugs. So in a way, that makes our job much, much easier. And when you can work with confidence, you can develop much more, uh, more resources and more tools. So I think that decriminalization, at least to me, what helps me is to work uh, and not have to worry about things that do not belong to my work. Because if, if I have to belong, uh, have to, to worry about drug policy and if I'm doing an illegal thing, I cannot really develop my skills in what I'm really good at. I cannot do anything about policy, but, but maybe I can do something with the person I'm sitting with. You know? So I think that, that that had an incredible impact. And that's why changing drug policies can have an incredible impact because it's al it allows a, a whole bunch of people to start working in fields that they would not work otherwise. I don't know if I'm answering your question with that. Um, I have a question about the ayahuasca experiences. Yeah. Uh, I've been to several and uh, I'm just uh, wondering how real are, are these other dimensions that I heard people talk about like aliens and reptiles mm. and everything. How mm. real are, are these? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. That's uh, a hard one, but, but it's a very, very important one at the same time. Um, I do not have an answer for that, and I don't think that there is an answer for that. What is true is that for the people that experience that, that is real. And then, from my approach, since I am a psychotherapist and I have a practical approach, for the clinical implications, that doesn't really matter, you know, if that is um, real or not. And at the same time, as a radical constructivist, what is reality? You know, reality is something that we are building, actually. Reality, it's, it's built because of us. If we didn't have ears to hear sounds, would sound exist? You know, like these Zen koans and all that. So I think this is a very interesting question that can be answered from different uh, fields. So if one was a philosopher, we can go into the, the, uh, the real reality of that. You know, do these planes exist or not? This is not the field I come from, so I, I take this more practical approach. You know, this person is feeling this. How can we use this for the well-being of this person? How do we work with the material that the person is bringing to really move forward? And uh, that, I know that that's cheating, but that makes my work a little bit easier. Yeah, so I'm sorry that I cannot answer your, your question that, that specifically. What is real is that many traditions talk about that. So if you go to, to uh, the Hindu tradition and yoga, they talk about the subtle bodies. If you go to the Tibetan tradition, they talk about these uh, experiences out of body and going through the bardos. If you go to many other traditions, they talk about energy. So this is something that, it's something that belongs to the human experience. So in that uh, sense, Let's take it as a, another part of reality, whatever that is. Um, I was wondering if you have any quick guidelines to help people in general guide them to uh, proper preparation for using psychedelics. Hmm. As your perspective from a cosmic care specialist, for example. Yeah, I would say that that just stick to the basics. You know, if, if we're talking about psychedelics, that would be the same thing if we were talking about holotropic breathwork or, I don't know, kundalini yoga or fasting or uh, inipis or any practice that can, that can uh, alter consciousness or bring you into non ordinary states of consciousness. Know what you're doing. If you are taking a psychedelic, which psychedelic you're taking? Which dose are you taking? What are the expected effects of that psychedelic? Yeah? I think it's very, very important also to know the kind of experiences that can happen, at least to have a sort of map of where can I go if I take this, this substance. I, I'm more familiar with Stanislav Grof's map, in which he talks about sensorial experiences, biographical experiences, perinatal and uh, transpersonal experiences. And that's a way to kind of chart the experience. So when you find yourself in a really powerful experience, at least you know that, okay, I remember that at some point this was possible. This helps a lot. This is a beautiful thing that happens sometimes at Cosmic. You have someone coming and what they say is, you know what, I'm, I'm dying, I'm disappearing. I feel like I'm melting on the ground. And some experienced psychonaut would be looking for that experience. I really want to melt with everything. I want to, to, to get rid of my boundaries and, and become one with the universe. But that experience, if you don't know that it can happen, can be a really, really uh, scary experience. So then, 
you give context to the person. Or, you know, this is something that can happen. Many mystics have gone through that experience, and even it's something that some people look forward because it's uh, they, they connect to something greater than them. Then that changes, and maybe they can allow themselves to to experience that. You know, so knowing what can happen in any map that is useful for you, it's a very good preparation. And especially deciding the set and setting. Who are you going to have the experience with and where are you going to have the experience with? I mean, these are basic things that we've been talking over and over and over, but since the globalization of psychedelics, we're kind of forgetting that, you know? So 20 years ago, if you wanted to drink ayahuasca, you could not go on the internet and say, ayahuasca Barcelona. Now you can do that and you can go to an ayahuasca session without having read anything about ayahuasca before. Well, 20 years ago, maybe you had to go to Peru. I mean, you had to have a, a powerful interest to, to do that, you know? So that's part of the preparation. Thank you. If we have time for more, there was a hand here. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about the help of integration during an experience in cosmic care, but how do you go about integrating an experience after the after the experience has been finished, if somebody like finished the trip and still has tr troubles with it, how do you integrate at that stage? Mm. Okay, I think that here we have to make the differentiation between two cases. If you finished your experience and you feel okay about that, and you're having no special anxiety about what happened in the experience, you can do whatever you want to integrate the experience, and the worst that, that, that can happen is that we lose an opportunity to heal and to, and to grow. You know, you just forget what happened. There's this sentence from the 60s, you know, that the psychedelic experience, it shows you the truth about the universe, but when you wake up next morning, you forgot about that. And that's a little bit like that, you know? So integration is trying to remember that and trying to put that in, into practice. So if you had no problems during the, the experience, paint, draw, talk about that, share your experience, be in contact with that, you know? See what experience is asking you to do, to manifest in, in physical reality. If you have had problems during experience and you're, uh, you're experiencing symptoms after that, then another approach has to, be, has to be taken. Usually, in such cases, therapy is very, very helpful. Um, so in, in my practice, I see people and I do like talking therapy, and I also do holotropic breathwork, which is a, um, another version of an ordinary state of consciousness that in a way allows you to go back to the experience that you had and and process it, uh, process it and go through the experience because the holotropic breathwork environment is, is very, very supportive. It's like maximum care for the person. So some people find that that is helpful for allowing the experience to unfold or continue with the experience. So yeah, the basics of, it, of integration are the same in all the cases, but some cases present some challenges, not because the nature of the experience itself, but but what the symptoms that the person is having after that. For example, someone that is, is having anxiety because they relieved a trauma that they didn't know about in the ayahuasca sessions, you cannot start doing the integration with a traumatic event. You have to start dealing with the anxiety, with the depression, with the panic attacks, with the loss of sleep. You know, you need to start there because if you don't stabilize that, you cannot go work with that. So, well, I'm getting into more technicalities of the intervention, but the idea is this. I don't know if I answer your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So you mentioned that... Um, sorry. Sorry. You mentioned that uh, for a lot of people, it might be the first time taking LSD at Boom. Yeah. And uh, how suitable do you think this that Boom Festival is for a first-time LSD experience? And uh, if you think it might be not this more suitable experience, considering mm -hmm. the con kind of context it is, what kind of preparation would you suggest to um, specifically, in this context, have still a good trip hmm. on the first time? Okay. The good thing about people taking LSD for the first time is that usually they are young. Young people can overcome everything, you know? So they have the most terrible experiences, and you know how, but they overcome that. That said, I think that Boom is an amazing uh, setting to have a psychedelic experience. You have nature, you have uh, a community that is not going to look weird to you if you're staring at the glass for half an hour, you know? You can have thousands of people walking around and no one is going to bother you. Try to do that in a club. It's going to be a different story. So in that sense, it's a very, very good setting. You have natural beauty, you have art, you have many alternatives in which you can enjoy the experience. So it's a, it's a fantastic setting. 
maybe if you, your experience takes you to a place in which you come up with a lot of anxiety and you're in the middle of the dance floor at three o'clock at night with uh, Durango playing, maybe that's a little bit too much. Yeah. Okay, then you have the alternative to change setting, you know. Maybe you're with some good friends and you say, whoa, this is stronger than I expected. Maybe we go to some place quieter and we talk for a while. So I think that the environment is perfect. Then what you do with the environment is a, is a different thing. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you because I kind of perceive, uh, it's my first time at Boom, but I kind of perceive that there is this kind of encouragement of trying drugs or having this trip or like consciousness like raising and changing through drugs. And how do you think that Boom also would be more encouraging or supporting people to kind of find more natural way to awakening, like consciousness awakening? So through, uh, as you said, the Kundalini yoga, meditation, and other form. Mm. Do you think that Boom could improve in this sense, or mm. is already doing this? Or mm. What is your, yeah? Mm. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I wish that you have a wonderful first time Boom experience. And it's also very good to see people from different backgrounds coming here. And this is also a reality. There's people in Boom that they don't use drugs more than we think. Yeah? It's also true that people here, we try lots of different drugs, drugs in in quite high amounts. That's also true because this is a psychedelic culture uh, festival, so it's, it's about psychedelic states. But psychedelics or meditation or yoga or martial arts or whatever, they are tools. They are tools for transformation. So as any tool, it depends on how you use that tool. You know? So psychedelics are not the, the only way. And actually, the BOOM program reflects that very well. If you turn the program on the uh, being fields, area that's called this year, you have a whole bunch of activities that they are not drug rel related, you know, so so in a sense it is already here. I agree with you that the main focus of uh, Boom is psychedelic experiences, but hey, that's what we like and what we want to talk about that, you know, so so that's, that's cool too. But it's it's interesting, this, this question was asked to Jack Cornfield, uh, kind of, you know, so they, they were saying, Okay, it's not better to do meditation or yoga instead of, of trying psychedelics. Psychedelics may look like the easy way. If you've done enough psychedelics, you know that when it gets difficult, it gets really difficult. So it's not an easy way or a fast way for anything. It's been said also that psychedelics, they allow you to see the top of the mountain. And then the work is to really integrate that and climb the mountain yourself. But since you've had the psi from the top of the mountain, it's like an extra encouragement. So Jack Cornfield said that, OK, it's true that at some point you can stop taking uh, psychedelics, for example. It's also true that most of the main gurus and spiritual teachers from the 60s and 70s, they started this path because of psychedelics. It seems that psychedelics, they, they have really the potential to open us to dimensions that they are not easy to access without psychedelics, or that it would take a, a longer uh, uh, time to access them. And in the society we are now, if something takes 15 years, maybe I don't embark on that journey. Yeah, if Maybe that would be good for me, but I don't really know if I want to devote 15 years of my life with the hope that I'm going to have an enlightening experience with meditation. But hey, maybe I have an LSD experience. I've discovered some spiritual dimensions, and then I'm driven to start meditation, You know, because I see some value on that. And I think that's the way that it, it co-creates this, this process. So boom could be better in this approach. I don't know how, but maybe being aware that there's people that don't use drugs and they also like to come here, which is, is true. So <laughs> thank you very much. OK, so thank you for coming. And have a wonderful boom. Thanks. Right, everybody. Give it up for Mark Salah.